hello everyone. Uh, welcome at the last uh, discussion during uh, our today conference. And uh, today uh, at this uh, panel discussion, uh, our guests are Mr. Sławomir Maiman, uh, former chief of uh, Polish uh, Trade and Information Agency, and uh, Mr. Jacek Bartosiak, PhD, uh, Polish geopolitician, and uh, well, uh, bestseller uh, author of uh, many books covering geopolitical uh, topics. And uh, we are going to discuss uh, the rise of uh, China in the changing global order, as well as uh, rise of uh, Global South. And uh, we are going to uh, discuss uh, whether China uh, will be beneficial on this uh, reconfiguration of uh, global order, of this uh, rise of Global South. And uh, to start with, uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Bartosiak about this main factor driving this uh, change of global order. So uh, how long do we know that China is rising? How know it has its impact? How long uh, we know that it has its impact on global order? And what are main uh, factors, main uh, competitive advantages of China that are driving this process? Okay, thank you for having me here uh, on this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, I will do my best to, 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 to make a brief introduction into the topic, which is uh, of the highest importance these days. So first of all, the rise of China that uh, arguably is uh, observable <laughs> since the, the beginning of the century uh, is the most uh, seminal event uh, in uh, in this 21st century and potentially after the industrial revolution and some chinese scholars and strategists claim that this is the most important phenomenon since the great ocean discoveries in the 16th century 15th and 16th, 16th century changing the world order at the um, at the huge scale but let me propose the following um, the following description what is happening because it will be more tangible for all people listening the um, the last 30 years was the uh, the quite uh, the unique period of unipolarity when the america has uh, a, an advantage of primacy so the um, uh, united states united states designed the strategy of primacy where it decided on all important matters of the world there are a few systems world systems world orders that we have known in the history there's an imperial order like in the roman empire and the empire itself is the order so there is no interactions in the international system because the empire imposes on everything uh, as it stands and this had not been known for a long time now. The second, the second uh, kind of order is the primacy, and the United States had this, had the, has had this primacy over the last thirty years, and wants to keep it. Judging from the last Biden speech, it wants to keep it. The most fundamental force altering this calculation that the the, the, the United States primacy must be sustained is the rise of China, per se. The third option is the um, equilibrium. Equilibrium, which may, may be obtained in two versions, either a concert of powers, where like after the Congress of Vienna and Europe, where great powers established an order and agreed on main principles, how they operated towards each other, or the Westphalian system known in Europe after the, the Thirty Years' War, where many small many middle medium or great powers are balancing each other out creating a, a sort of the uh, more or less equal system of balancing states and uh, the problem is that the united states since it uh, entered the world stage doesn't know anything else as only the system of primacy and its version which is that dual system of the uh, us against them like in the cold war united states with the allies around the united states as a security provider western allies against the soviet union and its uh, satellites 
it was also because the United States enjoyed the, the, the supremacy in the world ocean, the military supremacy, nuclear supremacy, throughout the large, large periods of, of the Cold, Cold War. And of course, the um, it controlled the strategic flows of the world. It was still a primacy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. So the, the problem is that the United States uh, establishment doesn't know how to operate in anything else as only in the system of primacy. And the rise of China is creating a major shockwaves to the system. And now speaking about the global south, until recently, the whole world system was operating around the European great powers and their offsprings in United States, Canada, Australia, and elsewhere. While the, the rest of the world had to follow the principle for strategic flows that were decided in New York, London, or elsewhere in the West, creating in this way the supply chains, the value chains, and the division of labor in the world. With the rise of China and the, uh, I'll say that the, uh, the development of the South, this is changing. So the global South is a new center of gravity of competition. Who will gain the foothold there? And who will convince the global South, broadly speaking, global South, will prevail in this competition? And this competition about the hearts and minds of the global South and their pockets, of course, will be about the fourth industrial revolution, will be about AI, will be about digital economy, will be about the influence, will be about the uh, financial settlements, whether we're going to be in the dollar system or something else. So the global South will be a center of gravity. The middle class increasingly will be in the global South. And in this way, the burden of, of the world is moving and shifting. Just at the, at the end of my preliminary opening remarks, a few statistics. I was listening to Mahubani, uh, foremost uh, Singapore, Singapore strategist, who had a speech two months ago in Beijing, where he was giving data as to how large the middle class of the country is called CIA, and it's not a central intelligence agency based in the United States, but it's China, India, and ASEAN, that is manifold bigger, middle class is manifold bigger in, the, in those three areas than the, in the entire West. And it's the middle class that buys, it's the middle class that spends, it's the middle class that wants to drive cars, and it's the middle class that wants to have the uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, operating by them. So what I think is that the, um, the, the role of the global south is increasingly important. It will be a battlefield between the, the United States and some countries of the West that will be gravitating towards the United States. United States at the moment does not understand that trying to create the situation, dual situation between us and them, meaning between China and, be, and us with the US in the, at the center, is not going to work, but it will create tensions as the competition between China and US is completely different from the one between Soviet Union and the United States in the globalized world. So it will be very difficult for the United States to discipline its allies and uh, client states and partners to follow the um, the breakdown of economic ties, decoupling, or any other ideas that they might have in order to keep the, uh, the, the strategy of primacy in place. Let me finish at this moment. Maybe I will elaborate on those a bit later. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your great introduction to our discussion. I think it will be much easier for me now to uh, go to some specific uh, points. And uh, now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Maiman about this uh, great problem of uh, our times, this uh, winning of minds and hearts of Global South. You yourself visited uh, many of these countries. Uh, you visited many African countries, East Asian, also Central Asian countries, and you were there as, uh, well, Polish uh, economic diplomacy 
uh, representants. Uh, so you spoke to many businessmen uh, there, to their uh, governments. And I would like to ask you about uh, what we, of course, can make uh, such generalization. What uh, this Global South uh, thinks about the West? Uh, is it true that, uh, well, anti-colonial, anti-American, anti-imperialist uh, resentment towards the West is uh, life and is uh, rising in Global South countries? What do you think, Mr. Maiman? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh... Uh, thank you that you are referring to my past past position of the head of the uh, Polish Information uh, Agency. But uh, let me introduce myself with my current position. I'm Deputy Director of the Institute for Security and International Development. And uh, before I answer to your question, I'd like to echo from this position, uh, Dr. Bartoszak, with your kind permission, because actually before we come to the uh, uh, reaction of the global south to what's happening now on the global arena let's figure out uh, some evangelic truths what's happening now uh, in fact first of all uh, we are facing the cognitive shock uh, because actually within less than two generations china changed from the revolutionary state via the extremely painful process of uh, internal reforms into aspiring global leader. It's a cognitive shock, not only for us observers from the West or observers from the South, but first of all, it's a, it's a big shock for the Chinese population and Chinese elites. This is the first fact, uh, evangelic fact. The second evangelic fact is that uh, especially uh, uh, under the rule of charismatic Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Uh, China dramatically changed their position in the world. They started, uh, they stopped to be a shy giant as they used to be even uh, uh, after Deng Xiaoping reforms. May I remind you of the, uh, the 24 Chinese lettering of uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, uh, hide your power, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't take a lead. Uh, and uh, China became assertive player on the global arena. Uh, and uh, you can mention such initiatives where China is participating quite actively, like a, uh, like a Shanghai group or BRICS or especially recently G20. But the most important is that China is a creating extremely powerful instruments directed, first of all, to the global south of the old. I have in mind a Belt and Road, which we uh, in Poland called New Silk Road. Of course, uh, uh, Belt and Road, which is a national Chinese project, uh, the national Chinese project, uh, is existing here in Europe. But first of all, it's uh, existing in Africa, in Central Asia, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And the intention of the creator of this project, which is Chinese leader, is to, first of all, uh, increase economic and political influence of China in those uh, areas which you kindly call the Global South. And the second, maybe even more powerful instrument of China uh, again, created by China, it's not participation to any organization or whatever, is a global development initiative. The global development initiative, uh, enormous project solely directed to the global South, to the countries which will never be able without Chinese help uh, to meet the requirements of a sustainable development agenda 2030. Uh, I, I mentioned briefly G20, and uh, a couple weeks ago we had a meeting of G20, which was considered as a success of Ukraine. The Polish media were writing about the success of India, which is, which, which is, I'm not very sure, but they say that India is going to be the next global superpower. But first of all, it was a considerable success of China, because China pushed into G20 African Union. And 53 African countries joined the Global Development Initiative. 
Anyway, uh, this is the second evangelic truth that China became not only a player in the uh, 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 global orchestra, but they became a soloist in this global orchestra. And the third point is uh, this evangelic truth we know, uh, everybody in the, of us knows about, is that the center of gravity in the world moved from the uh, 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 Euro-Atlantic to Indo-Pacific. And this change of the center of gravity is first of all result of the growing of Chinese role and reaction of the United States, which decided to, to in the, uh, many ways to curb the development of China on in the Pacific area. And this is the United States who are in the area, especially after pandemics, uh, 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 because they want, uh, the, the United States want to win this competition uh, when they have a still uh, uh, priority on, on the sea and the oceans, which is, which is the fact, where possibly they are still ahead of the technology, but not, not for a long time. And possibly they are still ahead of the, in the economic development, uh, 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 development, uh, and uh, it will not last longer, maybe than ten years or five years. United States are in a hurry to create a competitive environment on Indo-Pacific, and this is the third evangelic truth I want to tell you. And uh, uh, the name of the game is a, not a competition between the United States and Russia. The name of the game is the global competition between the United States and China. Uh, and uh, the major element of the Chinese politics is a question of security. Uh, the the, the, the uh, some observers of China's political stage counted that uh, Xi Jinping, in his speech at the 20, 20th Congress of the CPC, used the word security 87 times. It's not about military security. It's a uh, security of supply chains. It's a security of a uh, labor market. It's security of a uh, fair distribution of wealth in China and so on and so on. But anyway, the uh, a major element for a Chinese approach to internal and international affairs is security with a special understanding of it. And uh, uh, definitely we are facing a sort of a revival of the uh, uh, conflict or growing differences be between global north and global south. We used to forget about it for at least a re recent 30, 40 years. But there is one more element which uh, uh, speed up this confrontation between uh, east and west, uh, south and north. This is all of a sudden war in Ukraine, the Putin's aggression. Uh, and very crystal clear, you can see the difference between a, a Western approach or Northern approach to it and the approach of the uh, African, Asian and uh, South American countries. Uh, in the best case, we can hear from the people from the, uh, from the global South, uh, simply it's not our war. In the worst case, we can, we can hear, uh, let Americans lose it. And now uh, um, you mentioned uh, some possible reasons for uh, uh, for uh, this uh, approach of the South. First of all, uh, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, majority of the developing countries, or which we used to call developing countries, are not afraid of Russia. They don't treat Russia as a superpower. Power. Uh, of course, we know plenty of nasty cases of that Russian behavior in Asia or so, but somehow it's forgotten. But what is not forgotten 
is American exceptionalism, which Dr. Bartoszek mentioned. Uh, I mean, deep conviction of America that its design, its destiny is to rule the world. Uh, uh, the world likes it or not. Uh, what they still remember is American imperialism. And what they still remember is a uh, heritage of colonialism. Uh, and and we are when 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 we see how uh, 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 French flags are burned from for instance by the crowd in in in, in, in Niger, it's because of this uh, uh, memories, this uh, deeply rooted perception that the West is still dangerous. This is about the population. Then. Uh, both uh, Belt and Road both, and the Global Development Initiative and all those uh, bold uh, Chinese infrastructure projects in uh, Africa or some countries of Asia uh, are welcomed by the strong men who are ruling on, in these countries. Because the difference between Americans or Western Europeans and Chinese is that Chinese are not asking uh, the questions about human rights and democracy. They are giving money and they are building. Uh, Americans are not building infrastructure and they are not deli delivering infrastructure to those countries which are having so dramatic uh, problems with sustainable development. And uh, this is the, I would say, the uh, one more advantage of Chinese uh, presence in the in the in the global south. And and the last point in this uh, intervention, if you permit me. Uh, I think Francis Fukuyama was right when he called Xi Jinping uh, uh, that, that, that the Xi Jinping is uh, uh, rather resembling Ming Dynasty and not Mao Zedong. Because uh, 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 the current policy of Chinese leadership is somehow coming back to the tradition of China, which for a few thousand years was a, was a global superpower. And only in this short period of humiliation, as they call it, 150 years after Opium War until uh, until end of uh, and Mao era, they were not uh, a, a, a superpower. That's why what I want to say, that it's not communists, Chinese communists who created uh, Chinese uh, fight for the global leadership. They are not communists. They are simply the simply continuation, return of China to the place they desire, and, and they, 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 they should have this, due to the historical tradition. Uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, we had a, the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China, and one of my Chinese friends looked at me and said, "No, no, 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 Mr. Maiman, it's not." It's not the 100 years of the Communist Party of China. It's 100 years plus 5,000 years of the Communist Party of China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was quite rare, I think, and thus refreshing that you mentioned that Francis Fukuyama was right in something, because usually it's said that he was wrong in this one, well, title of his book, and maybe many of these people who are saying this um, didn't read this book. Anyway. Uh, I think that you both uh, make a great description of two uh, spheres, two factors of uh, this competition, this uh, economic development um, uh, factor, and uh, as well this cognitive, this winning uh, of mind and hearts. And uh, I would uh, like uh, to ask uh, now uh, Mr. Bartoszek about um, this uh, military um, competition, how it looks. Uh, like uh, now, because uh, as it was mentioned before, we are, are facing now two important uh, in context of our discussion wars in Ukraine and uh, while well, starting of uh, war in new war in Middle East uh, in Israel. And uh, well, from the one uh, point of view, we can say that Russia lost a lot of uh, its uh, military potential, a lot of people, a lot of uh, tanks and other uh, military military platforms uh, and uh, 
On the other hand, we can say that uh, China is uh, building uh, its navy, it's building uh, its uh, nuclear potential. Uh, so how it looks like in this uh, global view, how this uh, military balance uh, looks like, and uh, is uh, this uh, projection of uh, military force uh, important factor of uh, competition uh, in this global change, changing of global order? In order to answer this question, I need to contextualize a bit what the military power means. First of all, the United States is the most formidable military power on planet Earth. It has a planetary range power projection capabilities. It is present uh, in Eurasia and around it uh, elsewhere. It has a global reach, strategic lift, and a pr global precision strike. So on paper, it seems that the America feels the most, most formidable military. The problem is that there are two important factors that always need to be put into the context. First is the tyranny of geography. So how you project your power in order to have your way. So it is very difficult to project power of the United States across the, the, the wide Pacific Ocean to the Western Pacific, close to the, the Chinese mainland and the Chinese backyard. You need to sustain logistics. You need to keep operational tempo. You need to have ships. You need to have bases. You need to have ammo, fuel, <laughs> rockets, missiles, everything, and personnel in place. You need to have the uh, friendly uh, friendly areas, allies uh, with their emotions, national interests, and so on and so forth. So it's a very complicated game. It's good, to, it's good enough to say it. In a nutshell, it is much more difficult for the United States to project power to the Western Pacific close to the Chinese mainland as to, for the Chinese to have the capability to phase the American influence out, to, 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 to chase away the American navy from the from the waters around uh, in the south china sea or east china sea or in taiwanese strait so basically that's that's one factor that need, need to be taken needs to be taken into account i can elaborate in detail i don't know how detailed we are going to have this discussion the second factor is you, you in, in any war it is quite visible now in in case of gaza and this Israeli against Gaza thing, you need, you need to have a solid theory of victory. Whenever you embark on any confrontation, including kinetic war, you need to know what you want to achieve politically, what political objective you have in your, before your eyes. And you scale and you calibrate your military means and other means to achieve this goal. It's <laughs> historically, it is overwhelmingly difficult to do so by politicians and by the military. And especially the United States has had problems in calibrating it properly in the past. What, because what would be the victory of the United States against Russia or China? So what is the theory of victory? Decapitation of Xi Jinping? No. Removing of the Chinese Communist Party? making it a democracy, occupation of China, or maybe just cutting off their breathing capabilities by distant blockade of trade or imposing the sanction regime. And as Morgan Tao used to say at the times of President Roosevelt, waging peace, not waging war, by inf inflicting heavy damage on China by economic sanctions supported by the naval blockade. What would be the uh, what is the theory of victory against Russia, which is the main producer of of grain and the minerals in the world? So what is the political objective? What I think is, and I will conclude, the United States wants to keep its primacy, but the military that it has at its disposal, as 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 well as other leverages of power, are shrinking relative to the power of the Eurasia. The, uh, the alliance of Germany, Japan, Imperial Japan, and Italy was nothing, nothing 
in relative terms compared to the alliance of Russia and China. Neighbors, having minerals and raw materials and food, which the Axis, was the Second World, Germany, Japan, and Italy didn't have, and being the largest manufacturer in the world, being China, with huge population and access to the world ocean. The, uh, the Axis alliance and during the Second World War pales in comparison with the potential of China and Russia if they play together. This is why America, the United States establishment adopted the strategy of sequencing. They want to create the off offshore balancing by sequencing enemies, first dealing with Russia by a limited war means and by proxy war and imposing sanction regime. And it wants to achieve its political objective, two political objectives at one shot. First of all, a treating of Russian forces so that it that it, it is contained, Russia is contained, it's not exerting influence on the European peninsula. And at the same time, creating the conditions for anti-Russia and anti-China coalition among the Western allies, because the war is creating security dilemma, a security fear. It's much easier to mold an alliance around the United States in that, in that vein. And it must be admitted that the United States demonstrated the strategic mastery in handling the war in Ukraine so far. Because it, they are not winning this war, they are not losing this war, but Russia is being treated. And the anti-Russian coalition has been formed. And there are some prospects of anti-China coalition also in the foot, foot in sort of the uh, as a sort of wake of this uh, war in Ukraine also is still possible. Still, they are attributing the nuclear power, fighting conventional, full-scale conventional war close to its heartland ter territory without committing a single U.S. soldier, without a single U.S. soldier being dead, expanding NATO, encompassing Sweden and Finland, and also disciplining France and Germany. If they thought about, you know, designing some Eurasian game with China and, and Russia. But it's not going to be that easy against China. But I fear the temptation of the success of a limited war in what I already call a scalable world war that was unleashed three years ago. And in a sequence of clashes, in a sequence of confrontation, in a sanction regime, in a technology war, in a cyber war that is already upon us, the United States is, is trying to is trying to do this offshore balancing by the means of creating the environment where China will stop rising and the anti-Chinese coalition will arise. And here again, the global south is a pivot. <laughs> what they will do might decide the future of this relationship and the future of the world. The problem is that the Cardinal Richelieu used to say that whatever you do in foreign policy, your means must equal your ends. And uh, increasingly, I believe that the strategy of primacy is not backed up properly by sufficient means and resources. That's a major problem for Poland, which is the close to the uh, to the confrontation zone. That's increasingly a big problem for Taiwan which uh, shares the same position and from the entire world because there must be a sort of an equilibrium and this equilibrium is broken now. So what I increasingly feel and fear is that we are approaching the situation that misperception and miscalculation over intentions and capabilities between the United States and China may spiral down to some incident in the South China Sea or in the Strait of Taiwan, where it will be convenient for e any of those parties to escalate it a little bit just to delegitimize or remove the credibility of the other party. And we will have this called Sarajevo moment. 
from which it will be very difficult to to you know scale back the confrontation also fueled by this feeling that yeah well we got we can make it against the nuclear power because we did it in ukraine the limited war is doable as albert colby tends to say in his book strategy of denial and he was the author of the uh, of the military strategy of the pentagon during the, the trump's era uh, well we're doing fine we can manage sanction regime wedging peace or, as morgan Tao used to say and limited war by proxy plus technology war may derail china yeah so this is what i feel what, what i increasingly fear and i think that this inflection point is coming faster than i expected a few years ago let me stop here thank you very much and uh, mr maiman i would like to ask you whether you agree with uh, what mr bartoszak said about how usa is navigating uh, this uh, time of change uh, is usa in fact uh, well making it uh, very good from the point of view of its own interest uh, this winning in um, this uh, small war in ukraine and uh, well managing to reaffirm its own forces to enlarge nato and so on well do you agree that uh, usa is uh, on the good uh, good uh, way from the point of view of its own interest you know um I can reconfirm that China is in a very difficult strategic situation because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I, I like various uh, poetic expressions of Xi Jinping uh, um, to describe the challenges of China. Uh, Xi Jinping said that, uh, that China is facing high winds, choppy waters, and dangerous storms. It sounds a little bit like a, a John Donne or other mystical English poets, but it's very true. High winds, choppy waters, and uh, dangerous storms. Uh, a lot of observers, in, in, uh, including Polish observers, uh, uh, tend to write that China is benefiting from this uh, Putin's aggression, that the Russia for somehow would be the uh, um, uh, the domination of a uh, China of China over Russia will be somehow strengthened and dependence of Russia will uh, appear. I don't believe in it. Uh, there are at, le at, at, re uh, at least I suppose three reasons why China is in in, in unfavorable unfavorable strategic position. Uh, uh, the first reason is that. Uh, it's Russia, uh, weakening of Russia. Uh, on the eve of the war, during the Putin and Xi Jinping meeting at the Beijing Olympics last year, uh, we reached so, sort of a peak of the Entente Cordiale of friendly relations between China and Russia, because they were strategic partners, no doubt about it, before, but uh, last February demonstrated that they are extremely close ideologically. If you could remember what they both said about the rotten West, uh, 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 um, moral uh, catastrophe of the West, LGBT, whatever, uh, and how closely they re reach understanding on this ideological platform, it will be easy to figure out that uh, Russia is something more than supplier of uh, oil and gas to China, or something more than the uh, 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 strategic military partner for China. It's, it was a real, real ideological closeness. Uh, a lot of people are asking why China is so strongly supporting Putin and are supporting Putin for many years. Just two little sidelines. In 91, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Beijing was somehow panicking. 
And the first result of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and, and, and collapse of Gorbachev, of course, was a dramatic change of the Chinese reforms by Deng Xiaoping from the reforming socialists, because they noticed that it doesn't work on the Russian example, into building a, a Chinese market economy, to be very, very brief. They, they, they simply entered the completely different stage of reforming China economy. And then during Yeltsin time, all the 90s, Beijing was horrified because what they wanted was to, 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 to see stable and uh, the credible Russia, not this total mess which was created in Russia during the Yeltsin and, 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 and all those oligarchs, uh, inefficient state and, 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 and shaky, mili sh shaky military and so on and so on. And when Putin appeared and made a sort of order in Russia, it was a great relief for Beijing. That's why uh, Putin is a uh, from the very beginning of his rule until now, very strongly supported by the Chinese leadership, but as well by the Chinese population. Because what China wants is a peace uh, 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 behind the northern bar, uh, peace and rule uh, and, uh, and uh, lack of any turmoil uh, behind the northern border. Uh, and uh, this is the first reason, weak Russia and weakening Russia is against Chinese interests. The second reason is that a Chinese strategy was to believe into some autonomous uh, strategy of European Union in this global conflict, uh, uh, USA, USA, China. Uh, and it turned out that uh, this autonomous strategy of Europe in many uh, uh, things, not only uh, about China, is non-existing because the war in Ukraine created the conditions of unbelievable and unexpected European unity and European unity with the United States. And the third point, why China is not in advantageous position is, a, uh, is the fact that the pressure of the United States on their allies in Europe, but as well in Asia, Korea, Japan, Australia, is growing. And those countries can hardly resist this American pressure. Uh, and one of the examples is our country as well, which was uh, uh, applying sort, sort of a zigzag policy toward China. And um, now we, we became the member of the American American Club, America, Britain, Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, possibly. And then, and, 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 uh, and the space for this Polish zigzags uh, is very limited. Of course, Poland is not important from China, and China is not important for Poland, but it's one of the hundreds of examples. Anyway, I suppose that the war in Ukraine and Putin's aggression is are definitely favorable for the United States. This is the first point. The second point is. Um, uh, the process which we can see now and, uh, uh, and um, the, the process which is getting stronger and stronger without going into details, process of a de-westernization of the world, de-westernization of economy. Uh, just one figure, I hate figures, but uh, uh, if uh, the share of so-called global south in the global trade was 10 years ago, 20%, it's over 37% now and is equal to European share in the global trade. And it's definitely going to progress. We are mentioning uh, diversification, we are mentioning the Belt and Road project. But what does it mean for, um, uh, for developing countries? It means uh, that the Chinese managed to create 400 thousand twenty uh, four, or four hundred thousand new jobs in Asian and African countries as a result of Belt and Road that as they claim uh, helped 40 million people uh, abroad China to, uh, to, to, to to lift from the poverty uh, um, 
I'm not mentioning the 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 the, the cases of building the the the, 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 the uh, infrastructure, all those high speed uh, trains, which those the, those countries will never be able to, to build, or energy sector in Central Asia, Turkmenistan, for instance. Uh, anyway, this diverse deindustrialization, which possibly could happen anyway, is very strongly pushed ahead by Chinese, and this is a successful element of Chinese foreign strategies. And finally, the final point is uh, this Cold War we were talking about at the beginning of our meeting. You know, I can only repeat that the Cold War of my youth, this Cold War between the United States and the, and the Soviet Union, was much simpler. It was just a military and ideological competition of two, two superpowers. Uh, okay, there were wars per procura in Angola, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union wanted to impose in, uh, first of all, in African and Asian countries, their system of values and, 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 and the political system as well. Uh, Americans, of course, they were as usually um, tried to, to, to push the American system of values to developing countries they wanted or not. Uh, but it was relatively simple. The current Cold War, this Cold War between Americans and, uh, and Chinese, is highly sophisticated because we have several levels of this war at least. There is a, a war of corporations, there, there is a, a okay, a military competition, there is economic competition, first of all, there is technological competition, but uh, what is the, it's a really strange Cold War as uh, China are still the second export partner of a uh, United States after Canada. It's a strange Cold War if a uh, hundred thousands of Chinese students are peacefully studying in America. It's a strange Cold War because we uh, uh, we say, okay, the Pax Americana and the uh, and unipolar world, which started in ninety one, uh, and, and 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 it was not questioned by anybody, despite that there was no Versailles Treaty and there was no Vienna Congress. Everybody agreed that the uh, Washington consensus and and and, and, and the and primacy of America uh, are the rule, and it was like a, like that thirty years. But okay, uh, but uh, where have we moved? Is it a bipolar world, as some Americans say, or is it a multipolar world, which is the official ideology of Communist Party of China? Uh, okay, we have a multipolar world if we say so, but at the same time, there's only one country in the world which is able to send their troops and vessels to any point in the, in, in the global map. That's why uh, we can claim that, uh, that everything is still very, very relative. And uh, uh, this is the great challenge for aspirations of China Question mark, what are the aspirations of China? Are they going to be the number one player in the global orchestra? Or they want simply to disperse this global orchestra? And this is a great challenge for America, which as Dr. Bartoszek absolutely correctly said, is used to um, sort of a selfishness uh, as a, the single ruler of the global arena. Thank you very much for your answer. And as we are uh, slowly uh, coming to the end of our discussion, I would like to ask you to make some uh, some final remarks. And uh, well, I think that you both uh, agreed that this uh, Global South is uh, one uh, of the main, uh, well, it's a really important factor who will have uh, better relations uh, both as it comes to politics econom and economic with uh, Global South. Uh, you both agreed that uh, as we are facing uh, challenges of uh, war in Ukraine, uh, the USA is beneficiary of this uh, of this war. However, I would like to ask you as well, 
um, if you could uh, try uh, because of course as uh, western people you as well as me have uh, our own perspective we mainly uh, based on uh, sources from our um, from our uh, well uh, western sources uh, and i would like to ask you to try uh, to um, well, make uh, this point of view of uh, China, because I think that uh, if we reverse this, uh, looking at this problem, we can say from the point of view of China that, well, at first, uh, war of Ukraine is uh, first uh, war, which is uh, focusing USA in other uh, place than uh, South, uh, South uh, China Sea. And uh, now we are facing this uh, Israeli war, which is uh, another uh, factor that is uh, making USA focus somewhere else. Uh, and as well, it is deepening this uh, difference between uh, West and uh, Global South, as we can see um, as now, uh, for example, Muslim world is, uh, well, uh, seeing that uh, Western world is uh, supporting uh, Israeli and uh, not uh, their brothers and sisters um, and uh, I think that uh, from the point of view of China it can be said that it is uh, something uh, that uh, makes uh, this window of opportunity for, for China as well so well uh, could you try to to make this uh, another point of view uh, Mr. Bartoszek I'll make it I'll make it very short China wants to rise and wants the things to be as they have been. China wants to have a globalized trading system as it is, you know, the most productive country and it uh, benefits from the openness of the system. The longer it goes, the stronger it gets, <laughs> as opposed to the United States. China wants to operate freely wants to have access to the markets, wants to have freedom of strategy flows. By paradox, America is trying to limit the openness of the system and exploit the uh, advantages that it thinks it still has in certain domains. So I think China wants to avoid war, what wants to avoid confrontation, but it doesn't mean that it has good intentions. It, of course, wants to grow. So it's not about anybody's fault. It is the rise of China that is creating this confrontation. Not the Chinese, but the rise of China and the change that it triggers, that it un 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 unfolds, unleashes. In terms of the uh, Chinese strategy towards the United States, I think that the China doesn't want to look as an ally of Russia. China doesn't want to side with Russia openly. China simply wants the system to operate and China wants to wants other countries to gravitate towards the Chinese economy, including the American allies. So China shouldn't do anything that would put China in the light as a being an aggressive country, revisionist country that wants to change the status quo. It should avoid everything possible to do it. To undertake any actions that may create the uh, pro-American coalition among the fearful neighbors or among the fearful Europeans. As regards the um, as regards the you know the strategy towards the United States, I think that the the, the Chinese should also avoid creating the possibility for the United States to, to exert the brinkmanship. The United States is trying to do actions to provoke a very aggressive Chinese response that would scare other countries. So the Chinese should avoid it. It's, it's easier said than done, but anyway, this is what I think. And the last sentence is, uh, it's, it's in the Chinese interest to thin out the United States. The more contingencies the America, Americans have, like Middle East now, then Ukraine, then this and that, the more dispersed, distorted, 
and overstretched the Americans will be, the less credible, credible they will look. Even in Poland, because the United States sent aircraft carriers and then ships to the Mediterranean, we fear that we may be, you know, Ukraine may be abandoned or Poland may, may not be helped. So credibility is a one balancing game. And uh, I think the Chinese under the, you know, lines will be testing this credibility by doing by proxy in some remote theaters like in the Middle East without uh, resorting to direct confrontation or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Maiman, what are your final remarks? So, uh, okay, let's be very brief. Point number one, uh, Chinese revisionism will continue. There is no doubt about it. Uh, because Chinese revisionism is deeply rooted in the imaginary and the history of the country and of the nation. Uh, Friedrich Hegel has written many years ago that um, civilization in the past, in case of China, civilization is a past, present, and the future. The second point is that um, uh, I suppose that the Chinese ha are having a project which is purposely gradual, strategic, strategically phased, uh, and it's sort of a long march. First of all, as far as uh, uh, Indo-Pacific is uh, concerned, and the uh, uh, Chinese rule at the what they call a Western Sea, which is Indian Ocean. This is the third. The third point is uh, is uh, Russia. Uh, if you read the statements and the documents published in Beijing and by 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 by, by official Beijing after twenty second of February last year, after the beginning of the war, it's sort of a menu a la carte because everybody can find something suitable for himself anti-american pro-russian uh, neutral whatever and the result was for instance that uh, a few months ago ukrainian president zelensky uh, was thanking chinese leader for their neutral position in the conflict anyway there is this sort of a la carte approach to the war in Ukraine, uh, but uh, at the same time, nobody uh, in old Chinese media, you can read that this war was provoked by NATO. Putin was simply forced to start the war, to, to, to push NATO far from its border. And secondly, that the Chinese are wholeheartedly supporting the Russians. But due to the geopolitical situation, will not uh, cross the red line when the moral support finishes and the physical help starts. And the first point, if you look at the recent history of the Chinese People's Republic, you will notice that China was developing only in the periods of international stability. Uh, and for the Chinese leadership, which is now facing this extremely complicated internal task the developing of the west of the country yeah the new economic strategy announced two years ago uh, in addition the 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 the, 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 the expansion uh, the stability is the major element of the success of uh, of a cpc and xi jinping program uh, of course uh, it doesn't depend upon China 100%. It doesn't depend upon America 100%. Because, may I remind you, when the Cuban crisis started, the most dangerous after Second World War challenge to the world peace, that time President of the United States, uh, John, Ken John Fitzgerald Kennedy and the White, uh, White House staffers were reading the book by uh, American writer Barbara Tachman, uh, uh, Guns of August. And it was a book, it was a story how nobody wanted the, sec the First World War to start, but anyway, it has started.
Thank you very much, uh, Dan, and uh, thanks to both of you for this enlightening discussion, for description description of uh, both Chinese and US strategy towards changing global order, as well as uh, well uh, uh, explaining importance of global south. Uh, and uh, well, thank you very much. Mm, and if you have uh, some more time, maybe we can uh, give uh, participants uh, possibility to ask one or two questions. Uh, if anyone wants to ask questions to our guests, our panelists, please go on. And if not, and if not, uh, we will be heading towards the end of our today's conference. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much.